Welcome back to another Cool Tool Show and Tell. Today my special guest is Mike Warren. Mike is an artist and inventor and a best-selling author. He's published hundreds of open source guides on 3D printing and laser cutting and chainsaw blenders and flamethrowing skateboards. He's, uh, he's got five books that he's published on making and engineering. His latest one is called Maker Wild and it's due out for Father's Day of 2021. Mike, thanks for joining us again and what did you bring to show us today? Hi, Donald. Thanks for having me back again. Uh, my new tool I want to share with you today is right behind me here, and it's my 90 watt, 24 by 36 uh, CO2 laser cutter. And we'll dive into some of the details from it, but I did my homework, did the research to what's out there on the landscape of lasers, and I decided on this machine. I've had it for about two months and couldn't be happier. All right. Now, real quick, what did it cost and and why why did you go with this particular model over some of the other options out there, uh, specifically some of the more maybe polished and consumer ready options? Right, right. Um, All in delivered to my door, I think, was twenty eight hundred dollars and and. That's a really sweet price point, and we can dive into that in a little bit as well. Um, but the reason I went for this kind of model over some of the more uh, polished kind of uh, brands that are out there is I feel like these types of lasers offer you more flexibility in what you're able to do um, in, a, in, a, in a cheaper package, mm-hmm. I guess. I think that's a good way to put it. What I imagine the the big deal for you here is power. And talk to me about why power matters in a laser cutter. Um, the wattage is what you're looking for, and the wattage really determines the thickness of the material you can cut. Uh, even brand name Glowforge, the Muse, Boss Laser, all have smaller form factors of their lasers, but you're also limited by the wattage as well. So the size of the unit um, will kind of dictate the power. The the tube in the back, the longer, the larger the tube is, uh, that's where the laser fires, that's where the power comes from. So for Muse and Glowforge, smaller form factor, you're only going to get, I mean, those are only 40-watt machines, possibly 45 watts if they juice it somehow, um, but that's all you're ever going to get out of that machine, no matter how you upgrade it, until you actually get a larger machine that can accept a larger tube. So this machine... Uh, sells for 90 watts, but that's the, it's a little bit misleading. 90 watts is the peak power of what it's able to produce, but sort of the nominal power band that it's going to hit is more like 80 watts. So this is billed as a 90 watt machine, but it's really an 80 watt machine. So you'll see that's that's pretty common in advertising. They'll say 100 watts or 110 watts, but if you look on all the tubes for the uh, for laser tubes, they actually write on the tube the the nominal wattage of it. So um, that's sort of a good thing to look at too when you're buying a laser. Don't don't always fall into the marketing ploy of you know whatever the peak power is because you're not going to be running your machine at at peak power. All right, and then what kinds of materials does this open up for you? Because I know with things like Glowforge, you're kind of restricted to that like the, the kind of cardboard width type of material. Um, what what are you able to do with this? What are you excited? to be able to, to, to make with this that you couldn't make with uh, some of those other machines? Yeah, great question. So um, with uh, Glowforge and Friends, usually eighth of an inch, right? That's usually the, the, the thickness. And there's some ways around that by flipping the material over and you know doing multiple passes, but you're in that ballpark. Uh, this machine, I've gone up to half inch on this machine, uh, wood, acrylic, um, yeah, cardboard, paper, all that stuff. And let's talk also about the interface and the software. I know that's a real differentiating factor for some of these products, especially for people who are, if this is their first laser cutter, how do you feel about that experience on this particular machine? Uh, so I love it on this machine. I love the interface. I love the software. Uh, the Glowforge and and the Muse and, and even Dremel for that matter with their um, 40 watt hobby laser, you're, you're not only buying the machine, but you're also buying into that ecosystem. They all have their own proprietary way to either connect to the cloud or the machine will talk to your computer. And I don't really like that because I feel like if something ever happened to on the hardware side for the company, let's say, so if Glowforge goes under, that's sort of the big concern. You could have a brick on your hands. This package is actually pretty, pretty neat. 
this machine USB uh, interface can connect to software you have. Uh, I invested in Lightburn. Um, I think Lightburn is $80 for a forever license, and you get two seats with that license. So um, I actually split that with a friend who also bought a laser cutter, so $40. Um, the cool thing about Lightburn is it's not just the software to run the machine. There actually is an interface in there that you can do design work as well. So you don't have to have um, an external um, software like Illustrator uh, if, if you don't want to. You could actually do quite a lot in, in the Lightburn software. So that's a nice kind of advantage. So not tied to a subscription model, not tied to a cloud, not tied to the internet specifically. Uh, the combination of Lightburn and a machine like this that has no sort of um, no overlord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, those are some pretty big selling factors for me on 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 that machine. I, I'm most encouraged by this to hear that there is now a an, this other software layer that you can use to make the experience a lot more usable and approachable and friendly. I think that's the main takeaway I'm really getting from this is that. Um, that that question of do I get like the the perfectly packaged you know ready to run laser cutter uh, at a premium even though I know I might outgrow this soon and have to get a different machine and get a different skill set to make that machine work um, that now I could pr probably go out and buy the level of machine that I really want that can cut the material width that I really want um, and that there's this I don't have to worry so much about a buggy Windows only interface that uh, is you know unstable and is going to crash on me. This machine came with not English instructions and it came together in an afternoon. I had to have a friend help me lift it cuz it weighs like 300 pounds. So getting it up on the stand was a little bit of a a little bit of an issue but um, honestly after that part throw away the instructions it was as simple as plugging it in USB to my laptop and running Lightburn, and the whole thing just worked. Um, so if, if I could, I'd actually like to talk about the story about getting this, because I did my homework on different types of lasers and you know looked at something directly from China to come on over. Um, but what I found was a company called Toolots, T-O-O-L-O-T-S.com. The cool thing about them and the reason I went with them, they are a middle a middleman from the factory from China. So I had conversations with people in China. They were going to custom make me a machine the exact way I wanted it, the wattage I wanted it. The problems come in for price, so they'll make it for you for a pretty hefty price, but then you're also paying the duty on getting it over here, uh, and they're putting it on a slow boat because everyone wants to save money. So even if you put down your credit card today and ordered it, you're probably looking at two months before it even shows up, and you're probably paying a lot in duty to get it over here. Uh, I don't know how Toolots did it, but I feel like they bought a whole shipping container full of these, mm -hmm. and they're based out of uh, Los Angeles. So I'm here in the Bay Area. Uh, I bought it from their warehouse in Los Angeles, and it arrived from giving them my credit card to here five business days. I think that was it, and it was delivered right outside my shop door, um, which was which was great. So it was the it was a nice constellation of uh, price timing. Uh, and then and then power and size of the machine. So when I took all that into consideration, call it three grand to have it delivered here. It's a 24 by 36 bed, so lots of room, front and back, pass through, motorized Z. I think I've probably got about nine to 10 inches on the Z for this. The whole bed comes out, which is great, so you can put even larger stuff inside. All that in one package was much more appetizing to me than a uh, package like the uh, the Dremel or the Glowforge, which is about half the size, less than half the wattage, and twice the price. But it brings up another thing I want to ask you about, which is ventilation. I feel like ventilation on these machines is another thing that's kind of kept me from buying one. Uh, how did you solve that for you uh, in your workshop? I'm really glad you brought that up because even though this machine was a great deal, it doesn't have everything. So. Um, it has an exhaust fan. Um, it, this particular unit came with, it, it, they call it a chiller, but it's not. It's just a water reservoir. So um, those two areas are actually something we could definitely talk more about. The, the fan that comes with this machine is sort of like uh, your CPU fan, but a larger, a larger version of it. And 
it doesn't do a great job of fume extraction. So I had to buy an additional exhaust fan that goes onto the back of the machine and then it vents directly outside the shop. So that was probably another $80 to $120 um, addition that, that this machine just doesn't have. And, you know, I think for the price, I, I don't think I was expecting to have all the answers in, mm. in one box. So uh, definitely worth investing in, in some good fume extraction. And I thought the model I got was pretty good for, for my exhaust fan. Um, I actually think it's underpowered. And in the next year or so, I'll definitely go up to something that has a higher CFM because those, what you really want to do is after you're finished cutting, you instantly want to open up the lid and take out your piece. And that's just not the case because you got to wait for the chamber to, you know, vent out all the stuff in there. And, and with a, a stronger fan, you'll be able to have that sort of immediate satisfaction. That's a minor kind of issue. But uh, when you run the machine all day, you kind of get into a rhythm and you want to get in there and run the next job. So uh, that's definitely a pain point um, that I would, I would, I think consider a little more before purchasing my first exhaust fan. Always better to kind of go overboard um, than than underpower it, which is unfortunately what I did. Cool. Uh, this has been a great talk, Mike. I hope uh, everyone's found it useful to hear from you. Uh, you can find more information on this machine and on Mike Warren down in the description for this video. And you can see thousands of reader recommended tools like these at cool-tools.org. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks, Donald.